this keynote is called, Is the West Still the Best? I'm Claire Fox, I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. Obviously, there is a discussion that constantly is going on at the moment about whether actually the West is in decline and whether we're seeing the rise of the East, whether it's the fact that China and India look to be economically thriving while Western economies are apparently collapsing. There's that kind of a discussion. There's certainly a discussion in the UK about educational standards. The fact that 90% of the world's PhDs are located in Asia certainly does give one pause for thought. But there's a sort of sense in which, in the West, there is a lot of nervousness about the East. But as it happens, I don't necessarily want us to talk about that at all. The reason why I was so keen that we have this discussion was that I realized that there was something more profound happening and that there's a sort of deeper discussion to have in a way about whether the West is spiritually bankrupt, whether it's overly decadent, whether the idea of the West is now completely tarnished. In some ways, this discussion on is the West still the best represents a kind of metaphor for a discussion on what our views are on progress, modernity, universalism. And I realize that when I have in arguments and panels that I've spoken on said that I support Western values like the Enlightenment, that I've been considered to be incredibly old-fashioned, seen as an apologist for imperialism, potentially, you know, the kind of person who's only interested in dead white men and nothing else. And if you know anything about me, I have a slightly broader repertoire than that. But I realized that there was such hostility to anyone who defended the West as an idea that this was something I wanted to uh, discuss. I'm now going to introduce our speakers. I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. I'm delighted because we've actually got an international panel. And as I said at the opening of this festival, because it's the 10th anniversary of the Institute of Ideas, we wanted to attempt to look uh, beyond the shores of, uh, of Great Britain um, and to actually have some international speakers. And by, as it happens, a coincidence, this panel is full of them. But I'm really pleased with who we have. First of all, then, we're going to hear from uh, Ian Morris, uh, sitting next to me, who's Willard Professor of Classics and Professor of History and Archaeology at Stanford University in the United States. Appropriately, and I'm sure you will have read the increasing coverage that this book is having, he's the author of Why the West Rules for Now, The Patterns of History and What They Reveal About the Future. Next to speak will be Gashba Tamash. <laughs> I know I'm saying it all wrong. Uh, he's uh, here from um, Budapest. He's a founding member of the Liberal Party in Hungary. He was a leading dissident uh, under the old regime and could be argued he's now a dissident again as the East has given way to the West, and in fact that's the way he argues. He's a visiting professor at the Central European University. He's been the head of the Institute of Philosophy of, of the Hungarian Academy and has taught at Columbia, Oxford, Chicago, Georgetown, Yale, and was a research fellow in Paris, Vienna, Washington, and Berlin. And the most important thing is he always makes you think. Next to speak is uh, Sabina Royal. She is somebody who has spoken at the Battle of Ideas over the many years, and we're delighted she's joined us on this keynote. Sabina is a society and politics editor of the German magazine Novo Argumenta, who is our German partner, one of the people that we've worked with on putting on battle satellites in Germany this year in Berlin and Frankfurt. She now runs the writer and translator agency Text Bureau Royal in Frankfurt, and she's also lectured at universities in Kent and Reading uh, when she lived in, in this country. And her writing on European politics and contemporary social theory is always startlingly perceptive. And last, we have Taran Tejpal, who is a journalist, a publisher, a novelist. He's the founder and editor of Telica, one of India's most important investigative journalists. He's fearless. If you uh, find out anything about him, you'll know that his journalism is not just revealing but brave uh, because he reveals things that people do not want revealing. The Guardian newspaper here named him as among the 20 people who constitute India's new elite. 
He has two novels that are published, The Alchemy of Desire, described by Le Figaro as a masterpiece, and The Story of My Assassins, international in scope, covering the whole of history. You've got six to eight minutes, Ian Morris. I should apologise in case I'm a bit incoherent. I just rolled off the airplane across the Atlantic a couple of hours ago, and it was um, the airplane from hell. It was the smallest transatlantic plane I've ever seen. Nothing seemed to work, and everybody was shrieking at the tops of their lungs half the way, it seemed. We got to Heathrow, and uh, we were being brought through the passport control, and the airport appeared to be falling to pieces. When you come through passport control, if you've got like an EU passport, the carpets have all come to pieces, and they're held together together with huge patches of duct tape. So we're coming through and I'm looking at all this and thinking, I'm now going to go and talk on this panel. Is the West still the best? Uh, We can't afford a new rug at Heathrow Airport. So this is very, very strange because I was also, in preparing to come here, I was looking through one of my guides to the reality of the world, this little book, I'm sure many of you have seen it, The Pocket World's Guide in Numbers or something. The Economist World what's it called? The Economist yes. Pocket Guide to the World or something. It has all the facts and figures you can ever want. And in that, I learned two-thirds of the world's GDP comes from Europe and North America. Two-thirds of the advanced weapons in the world belong to European and North American countries. More than two-thirds of the research and development money in the world is spent in Europe and North America. Between them, Europe and North America have only one-seventh of the world's population. So what's going on, I think, is the obvious question. Um, And this, uh, having now formulated this question on the trip over here, uh, unfortunately I wrote a book before I formulated the question quite that way, but I have a new book just come out which Claire mentioned, Why the West Rules for Now, beautifully produced by the good people at Profile Books, which will be on sale afterwards in all good bookstores, and I hope most bad bookstores too. This, like Claire said, is a comparative study of the Western and Eastern worlds across the last 15,000 years, looking for patterns, basically trying to explain why is it that this relatively small group of nations around the North Atlantic has come in the last couple of hundred years to dominate the planet in ways that have never really been seen before. And then if we can identify the patterns, the historical patterns that have caused this, can we use them to see how the world might go in the next hundred years or so? And I decided in my wisdom in the course of writing this book, there are strong patterns. We can see where they're taking us. I also decided that the patterns are basically geographical ones rather than cultural forces. It's really all about geography. And uh, I wrote a short piece that's going to be coming out in History Today magazine. And they came up with a very clever title, which I wish I'd thought of. They called it Latitudes, Not Attitudes, which I thought that was really good. So that's what I'm going to call it from now on. Uh, So my basic shtick in this book is that people are all much the same. And this geneticist and archaeologist, I think, have shown this beyond any serious dispute. People are all much the same wherever you find them around the world throughout the last 50,000 years. Human societies have all developed, I think, along broadly comparable paths and trajectories. What's determined the differences has been geographical factors. Now, that all sounds pretty straightforward. I'm pretty happy with that. I ended up writing a 768-page book, though, because as you probably know, history is a very, very messy thing. Uh, and It's a very simple theory, but very messy reality. The reason I think it's so messy, I suggest in my book that geography has determined why different parts of the world have developed at different rates. But what makes it messy is that the, the development of different parts of the world changes what geography means. So something that's a huge geographical advantage at one point can become a huge disadvantage at another point. The centers of power and wealth have shifted around the world um, because of this. Now, as we all know, Western Europeans, starting certainly by the 17th century, started to develop increasingly free and open societies. I suggest in my book this is nothing to do with long-term European cultural traditions. It's nothing to do with inheritances from the Greeks or, or anything like that. This is something that was forced onto Western Europeans by the ways geography changed their meanings in the 16th, 17th centuries, and particularly by the way the North Atlantic became the the core of a new kind of market economy that had just not been seen in the world before, which had all kinds of really horrific results, but also pushed Western Europeans toward opening their society up in ways that you don't see quite so much in the rest of the world. The culture, basically culture followed geography and economics. 
And one implication of this, I suggest, is that there's nothing Western about values like freedom, egalitarianism, rationalism, pursuit of scientific knowledge. These are not Western values. These are just the kind of values you get at a certain stage of social development. And it just so happens that geography dictated that the first part of the world to reach this stage of development was in Northwestern Europe. And so the people who are then empowered by the Industrial Revolution, all the guns and ships and everything else this brought, who go off all around the world shooting up everybody else and taking them over, these happen to be Western Europeans. It didn't have to be this way. This is a legacy of geography. Yeah, one thing, of course, everybody is very well aware of, if you look back uh, across the large sweep of history, there's not that many really open, really egalitarian, complex societies. Once you move beyond the sort of hunter-gatherer stage of world history, there's not that many societies of this free and open kind out there to look at. I suggest in my book that, again, this is nothing to do with peculiarities of European religion or culture or anything like that. It's just that in the way societies have developed through most of world history, the, the levels of social development they've been working at, very egalitarian societies don't work very well. They do occasionally occur. There are famous examples of them, but they just don't work very well. On the whole, hierarchical centralized empires have worked better than flat egalitarian types of societies. And that, I think, is, has been the long-term pattern. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is the normal state of things for human beings. Clearly, things do change. And it seems to me um, that as geography continues to shift its meanings across the 21st century, as we see this shift of power and wealth, which are kind of moved across the Atlantic in the late 19th and 20th centuries to North America, we now see them moving across the Pacific out to East Asia and South Asia. As these things happen, it seems to me the big question is, well, one of the big questions is what will happen to value systems as this change gets going? There are those who say that as China becomes richer, the very fact of making it richer will make it a more open and democratic society. There are others who say that is absolutely ridiculous. And what is bound to happen is, say, like happened when um, North America displaced Western Europe as the world's center of gravity, in a sense. You don't get a bunch of Americans running around complaining about how Europeanized their society has become. All the Europeans are wringing their hands about how Americanized everything is becoming. So the other school of thought would have it that as the center of power shifts toward East Asia, the rest of the world will become more and more like China, Korea, India, the, the great powers of the Eastern world. One of the other things I looked at in my book when sort of looking forward into the future was what the world might look like if present rates of change continue. And it seems to me our world is going to be unrecognizable a century from now. Kind of however things turn out, it's going to be unrecognizable to people like us. And I have to wonder whether the sort of question we're talking about here today, about Western values and democratic values, whether this is even going to make sense to people a century from now. Okay, Gaspar, your thoughts, please. Try to throw back your mind only, say, 40, 50 years. What had been the socialization models prevalent in what you'd call Western societies, European, uh, North American, and some other more similar societies? What happened to a person, mostly to a man, born in early modernity until very recently. People were born in a family, then went on to school, then went on to the army, to the army, there was national service, all males went to the army, then went uh, on to work in a factory or in an office, married, lived in a family, and until they were strong and lively, they worked in a workplace, then retired and died very soon afterwards. Most people spent their lives, their whole lives in institutions. Okay? The family, the army, the workplace, the marriage, and when they were not so safely ensconced and regulated, ensconced in and regulated by institutions, then they would join other institutions which will had to 
guide their lives in, so -called, in their so-called leisure time, mostly the church. The early welfare state has even organized leisure for people in organized ways, by paid holidays, by mass tourism, what was the name in Britain, Butlin' camps, and uh, Club Méditerranée in the uh, communist version of industrial modernity. It was even more uh, strongly organized, you know, even childhood and leisure and so on and so forth. So what people did, they never did alone. They were never alone. They were always, in all aspects of their lives, members of a strongly organized hierarchy. So they acquired skills, experience, and knowledge that referred to organization. People spend their lives in organizations, therefore they knew how to organize. Power was met by counterpower. Those people who worked under a very strong discipline in a factory knew how to organize a very disciplined revolutionary party to counter that system. People were asking in Eastern Europe, how come that uh, Hungarian insurgents in 1956 could keep the world's biggest army, the Soviet army, then at bay and fight for quite a long time successfully against them. Well, it's very simple. It was only 10 years after the end of the Second World War. Most people in their 30s and 40s had been soldiers during the war. They knew how to shoot. They knew how to organize a battalion. They knew how to man a checkpoint. And even people who were younger than that, they were doing national service. Nowadays, among yourself, who can handle a gun? Oh, God. Not bad, considering. <laughs> and, yeah, well, Making me nervous. the half, half of 1%. If I would have put this question in 1960, then, of course, all men in the room would have raised their hands. Now, the great comparative advantage of the West was its intensely institutional character. It was a unique combination of authority, deference, and of autonomy in self-organization, because when I speak of organizations, I don't always mean organizations that had been, or institutions, being set up by some supreme authority. Even the people, as it were, could organize itself. And capitalism in those times was not the only player. There have been rival strong institutions to its left and to its right, to its left organized socialism, trade unions, labor parties, and to its right, the churches. And these rivalities, these, these rivalries, these contests were determining the shape of political fights, but these fights, in spite of all the complaints about atomization and so on and so forth, were fights among highly organized crowds masses that were not atomized at all, but were very, very strongly and strictly organized. Mass parties, mass trade unions, huge followings of all churches. If you look at newsreel footage from the 30s, but also from the 50s and the 60s, you see huge crowds marching in the same direction. Something you don't see any longer. Membership of institutions, especially, especially lifelong membership in the workplace, lifelong membership in the church, monogamous marriage, people's rootedness, even by poverty, in the local community, most people have never seen a foreign city or even their own country except at the time when they were enrolled in the army and were taken somewhere. All those solid determinations and the centeredness of European culture on texts that is on fixed content, not variable, not variable, on fixed contents, our former historical disciplines that aimed in a puristical, in a purist way to establish the ultimate authentic text 
the real background, what was the real background, the real text, the real scripture, the real Homer, etc., etc. All that contributed, all that contributed for the West to have in most respects with the terrible conflicts we had a common ground. When we fought one another, we knew our adversary, we knew what we were against, and they knew what they were against, and it was a much more closed and a much more rational and a much more language and text-centered and a much more organized society. And thereby, conquest, triumph, single purpose, determination, commitment, political passion were easily available. People were close to one another. That was not always comfortable. And today, the communities that had been enforced by scarcity, by uh, the nature of the, the previous technology, have been all dissolved. Our mass parties, mass churches, mass unions, mass movements, mass memberships in huge professional ways of life being replaced as a community between people who never met one another through the social media and through the internet and through the more traditional media. Now all relationship between the members of the political community are mediated. Mediated but not through institutions of which they are members, but by institutions steered by suppliers that members are using as consumers and not as fellow members. The difference is tremendous. And this modernity is coming to India and coming to China, and we'll all sink together. Thank you. Your thoughts, Sabina? Well, the first point I want to make is that, of course, the issue is not really whether the West is still best or whether it's about to go up or down. In fact, I mean, if we take a humanist and universalist and a rational perspective on the world, I think we'd say it's not a bad thing if the West is taking a few notches down and if other people are actually claiming the position in the world they are entitled to. The problem more is that this process at the moment is causing a great deal of bewilderment within the West itself, as Claire indicated in the beginning. And that is, I think, where we get to um, the heart of the problem in the Western world itself today. Because for all the injustice and aggression that the West did visit on the world, particularly in the, in the last, in the 20th century, it did give birth to what we call modernity, a way of life that is shaped by a number of interrelated assumptions about what we are as human beings. It assumes that every human being has dignity, has the potential to develop, that we as individuals and collectives can advance and develop our uh, societies. It is premised on the assumption that the quest for knowledge is essential to our dignity as human beings. And of course, the people as a whole are the sovereign in this society, the subject that is really responsible for ensuring that we move forward collectively. Now this understanding of what it means to be human is in some ways, in fact, startlingly new. I mean, it's been around in Europe for about 500 years when the early humanists first began to conceive it. And following that, I mean, it's been a very, very long battle until these ideals became institutionalized in our modern Western societies, in the politics and the state and the cultural institutions that we do have. It's been a pretty bitter struggle um, against ignorance, inequality, authoritarian rule, and all the rest of it to even get to the point where we are today. So that is how modernity was created. And however large the gap may have been between the ideal and the reality, 
I think three things are pretty certain that the values I've uh, just mentioned are basically the best values that have been around to date, that in fact they are what most people around the world aspire to, and that above all else, you really have to look at how far they have gotten us in our modern societies. The problem is that this whole package of modernity, of enlightenment, is at the moment being challenged, not from without, not from China or from, uh, from Islam as our sort of fearful Western imagination thinks these days. It's being challenged entirely from within our own Western societies. And all the ideas I just mentioned about the good modern society are today completely up for grabs. Now, you only have to look at the level of politics where I think this is being expressed presently in the crassest form conceivable. To consider Germany, I, I think maybe people outside Germany don't really realize in what a state of chaos and disarray German politics is. Today, you have our Chancellor Angela Merkel in the morning meeting industrialists and admonishing them to do something for growth. In the evening, she gives an interview about the program uh, the Christian Democratic <laughs> Party is about to discuss and declares it's all going to be about the post-growth society. So this is the level of disarray and confusion that we see uh, at the level of politics today. Or, of course, if you look at another sphere, the debate, of course, that is uh, exercising the whole European continent at the moment, which is the debate about uh, Islam, we have had a situation where the sort of postmodern multicultural ethos has encouraged such a sensitivity to difference between different uh, people of different national or racial backgrounds, but in fact you now have the emergence of an incredibly strong aversion or an aversive trend towards a particular group uh, of, of immigrant people. So the problem is that Western values have over the past 20 years, I'd argue, come under such a sustained attack that we are now experiencing the full consequences of that. We have heard incessantly over the last 20 years, and it's in fact now accepted as truth by the overwhelming majority of our public opinion that striving for human betterment and prosperity just destroys our planet, that it's just greed, that we can't really control what we do because the world is far too complex and in fact we cannot really understand it that the ideals I just mentioned are nothing but Eurocentric fantasies, and that human beings in general are not really what they've been jacked up to be, but rather humble creatures. So in fact, to cut a rather long story short, we now live in a culture that systematically discourages ambition, that systematically denies the capacity of ourselves with reason to create a sensible world and a culture that basically calculates fatalism, passivity and of course a great deal of fear that goes along with that. And that denial of freedom and reason is really what at the moment threatens to overturn the moral and the epistemological foundations of belief in ourselves. And that is what I feel is most alarming about the present situation. And I think this really has to be a far greater concern to us than any temporary shift in the economic fortunes of one or the other part of the globe. Because whether or not the West uh, sustains itself flags a bit, is semi-overtaken by other nations or not. I think the maintenance and protection of those humanist and enlightened values uh, is going to be important for us and essential for the future, regardless. Okay, thank you. I have to say, uh, speaking after the grand professors for a journalist like me is like coming into bat after Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, 
Uh, but the good news here is that 20% of the time, Sachin gets out for less than 10 runs. Uh, you know, I mean, saying that is the West the best is a bit like saying, is England still the best soccer team in the world? The question really is, when was it the best soccer team in the world? And when was the West the best? I mean, this, I mean, where shall we start? I mean, historically, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I will seem terribly partisan, but I come from a very beleaguered part of the world. Uh, historically, look at the record of the West. Crusades, inquisitions, guillotines. I mean, look at the last 500 years. When you are at the same time as the Enlightenment, as the Renaissance, as the Industrial Revolution, you also have an incredible brutalization. I mean, colonialism itself, for those who have not experienced it, is probably a nice theoretical exercise, but the countries that have actually suffered colonialism are marred for generations to come. I come from a part of the country that suffers even, three, even 60 years later, 60 years after freedom has been won, the, the scars of colonialism are still extremely strong. You look at the record of the West, look at the record of the great North America, Red Indians exterminated, wiped out, all the tribes wiped out, the blacks till 1965, facing segregation. India, coming out of 300 years of colonialism in 1947, mandated universal suffrage for all its citizens, rich, poor, literate, illiterate, everyone over 21. Equ equality by law. Till 1965, the great North America, great, the great United States of America actually practiced segregation. It needed a civil rights movement led by a man called Martin Luther King Jr., inspired by a man called Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, to actually get blacks equal rights. Even now you see the problems there, it's, it's still not done. Australia, till 1973, under law, you were allowed to hunt down Aborigines. You could take a shot at any Aborigine and the law would let you go free. I don't understand this business of constantly imagining the West to be the best. It's a problem of self-reflection. It's like me looking into the mirror and seeing Brad Pitt. There is a problem, <laughs> you know? I, from, from, where, from where we come, we live in great distress about everything the West has done to the rest of the world for the last 500 years. In 1822, the GDP of China was the, was the highest in the world, and the second highest was India. I'm just giving you some statistics. In 1780, soon after the Battle of Plase, where Robert Clive de defeated Siraj Dollar, India's share of the global GDP was 18.2%. When the British left India in 1947, Britain's, Britain's GDP in 1780 was 1.7%, and India's was 18.2%. When, 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 when the English left India in 18, 1947, India's GDP the, of, the, of the world share, India's percentage was 1.7, and Britain's was 18.9%. We were sucked dry. I mean, I, I'm trying to understand where this grand idea of the West as itself, as being a great sort of enlightened and moral arbiter of the world and the world's affairs, comes from. In the 1940s, in, uh, there was an incredible famine, probably one of the most devastating famines in the history of Asia, the Bengal famine. 10 million peasants were killed in, in, in Bengal. All the resources of India at that time were actually diverted to England and to Europe to fight the war against Hitler, a war that we did not start, a war that the West was fighting within itself. Uh, so it was the West with the West, good or bad, they were doing it among themselves. And the resources from India were actually sucked out, 10 million that's a serious number. Amartya Sen has actually, his entire Nobel Prize winning treatise was based on the fact that had India been a democracy, there is no way 10 million peasants would have been allowed to die. But they died because the resources were all sucked away. Uh, let's talk about the present. I mean, uh, forget the past for a moment. Forget about the exterminations, the co colonization, the sucking out of resources. These grand cities of Europe built on the backs of labor and resource pulled out of the colonies of Africa and Asia and Latin America. Let's, let's, let's talk about what's happening now. Let's, let's look at the record of the CIA in Latin America in the, in, in the 1970s. The papers have just been declassified. Have a look at those papers. Every single democratic movement, every single democratic impulse in Latin America was actually subverted and sabotaged by the Americans. At every single place they were looking to, 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 to prop up tin pot dictators, looking to prop up um, henchmen whom they could then control. In our part of the world where I come from, in Pakistan, for 60 years, America has backed generals and tin pot dictators. I mean, I was in New Orleans just this week, well, that's where I'm coming from, where I was attending a conference which was about rebooting America. It was called the Innovator Summit. And I was astonished to hear the panjandrums of American foreign policy, many of whom were on a similar table like this with me, talking about the great democratic impulse of America and how it wishes to spread democracy around the world. And that's because Obama's visiting India. And I said, I'm really sorry. There's a huge difference of opinion in the way you see your role in the world and the way we see your role in the world. We are really bothered by our role in the world. We are bothered by our role in Iraq. 
We are bothered by our role in Iran. We are bothered by our role in Afghanistan. We are bothered by our role across the world because wherever you go, you actually end up not bringing peace and, and harmony. What you bring is a trail of destruction and social disruption. And so I don't know where this idea of the West as the best ever started. Um, if, if the idea is that the richest is the best, then I will grant it to the West. I think the profit impulse is so staggering in the West that it's pretty much undermined the whole, uh, the whole planet. You look at India and you look at the things they've been doing there. We, we, had, a, uh, we had a terrible tragedy in 1984 where Union Carbide's uh, gas leaked out, killing 20,000 citizens of Bhopal. It's been 26 years, the citizens of Bhopal have not been recompensed. Meantime, Union Carbide, through a whole uh, degree of slates of hand, is actually trying to come back to India, to India as Dow Jones, pretending it had nothing to do with Union Carbide. Every time you look around, Monsanto wants to come to India because there are profits to be made. It is always about profits. I'll tell you what the West is fantastic at. It's fantastic as pitchmen. It's a great salesman. I mean, it's so good that we, the good news is we've begun to ape them also. So even we drink water out of plastic bottles in India now. <laughs> You know? So I think the grand idea of the West is the, is the idea of consumption. And I'm not too sure, but that makes for a better world. I'll tell you, I mean, the, the, the man whom we will all have to go back to is a man called Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who 100 years ago was beginning to blow the whistle on consumption and saying it can't be sustained. We know Gandhi for nonviolence and tolerance, which, by the way, come from the East and not the West. The ideas, both the ideas, they've, they've, they've helped Nelson Mandela, they helped Martin Luther King Jr. Gandhi was consistently worried about sustainability, and I think we'll have to go back to Gandhi. But before I finish, since my time has run out, I'll just, I'll just let me uh, t tell you what Gandhi had to say about uh, Western civilization. He was asked that question once by an American reporter. Gandhi was asked, what do you think about American civilization, about Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can see a lively and very different taste up here. And I just want to uh, get a little bit of discussion going, but I won't last too long But before we go out to the audience. I'm actually going to start, in a way, with you, Taryn, and start this side, and then I'm going to come over. Because, funnily enough, everywhere I go in this country, people who one might describe as people who have been running imperialism for some time stand up and kind of basically make a speech which says... We have exploited the world. We are absolutely vile. We have blood on our hands, everything we've ever done. I mean, there is a palpable sense in which Britain is mired in sort of guilt, a kind of sort of narcissistic, obsessive, we are terrible. We, everything we've done, uh, we are the wrongdoers. And so it's quite interesting for me because I was involved in anti-imperialist politics for years. And, you know, some of the things that you've said would not be recognized. Now, you can't escape it. And there are times when I actually want to say there are some good things. Because what often happens is that you'll find that they are, what one might say, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So this becomes a kind of everything about the Western canon of literature and music should be junked because that's associated with the blood on our hands. Everything about modernity and some of the things about modernity, by the way, are universal values and great. Freedom, well, you know, it's all relative. You know, by the time you finish, you actually think, actually, at least I kind of knew where I was with imperialism. Kind of self-loathing, you know, kind of mealy mouthed imperialists, they really drive me mad. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? No, I, I don't think it's such a bad idea to be having a moment of wrenching regret about all your uh, all the depredations you've you've caused. But but I'd, I'd like to make a fine distinction here, Claire. I mean, I, I think you're wrong when you say that we are out there to actually throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think I think if if you look at most of the um, all the colonies, I can speak for my country. I don't know anybody. Any, I've only lived in one country, which is India, and I can speak for it. I can tell you that forget about enjoying and appreciating and admiring the Western canon. I mean, we are, we are all in some sense deeply uh, educated in the Western canon, whether it's Western mu In fact, it always bothers me that I know more about Western classical music than I know about Indian classical music, which in some senses has a greater provenance than Western classical music. But that, I mean, it's not just that we, don't, uh, we admire them. We are actually, as I said in the U.S. to these panjandrums of the state, we are actually incredibly fond of both Americans and English people. It's the, our problem is with both official America and very often with the official West. It's not with ordinary people. There is, I mean, I mean, you you know that very well. That today the the, the melding is huge. I mean, 
It's, everything is a melting pot. There are Indians and Chinese everywhere in the world. And so there are no issues about people to people. It's really about what the professor was speaking about, the institutional structures and the great policy structures that in some sense still see the world and the world's other people as instruments to be exploited. And uh, we are saying we're not there to be exploited anymore. Enough has been done. So, uh, Sabina, you were obviously describing um, or in your sort of take on this question, you were talking about what, it, what is called Western values really as human values, the best that humanity has achieved. But is there a danger, just based on what Taryn's saying, that you just end up being an apologist for, you know, Western excuses for imposing democracy on Iraq, Afghanistan, for imperialist adventures abroad? I mean, are you just kind of wrapping in a kind of humanist label what is effectively a pretty corrupting impulse from the West? Well, I don't really think so, because the strange thing is um, that the people today who would, for example, support the war effort in Afghanistan, which our Green Party in Germany, for example, has been doing, are the very same people who are denying the salience of, of the kind of Western, or let's indeed not call it Western, the kind of modern values of uh, freedom, individuality, and, and human potential. They are leading us on the road, or they want to at least, and they've gone quite a long way to doing so, on the road towards a no-growth society, on the road towards a society of complete regulation of individuals in all kinds of spheres, from smoking to how you bring up your children. So they're doing uh, the very people who would, uh, I find, terribly objectionable for their support of any kind of uh, intervention in, in other areas of the world are also the people who are uh, denigrating the kind of values I said I do think belong to those that have so far been best, no matter where they came from. Okay, so turning, turning to this side, as it were, just on the values question, um, I, I was um, interested, Gaspar, in the, the way that you talked about the changing social relations, and I mean, at the end, you said we're all, we'll all sink together. E even though what you were describing, um, uh, uh, which I thought was a, a perceptive and accurate look at the way things have changed, what I want to know is whether you think there's any possibility of fighting for more humanist values that have been denigrated as Western in many instances that could allow us to transform things, because there was a slightly over-determinist sense to what you were saying, and although, Ian, you were sort of saying, well, it's just a coincidence, geographical, and uh, it's too crude and not what you were saying, but, you know, it's just a geographical coincidence of the West at a particular time dominate and so on. There was something slightly deterministic about that as well. I mean, is there no point at which we have made something of, uh, historically, that the, the Western values were made by us, and is there no possibility that we can broaden them out as humanist values in a positive sense rather than all sinking together? possibly all change things together. So, Gasper first. I was trying to describe why the West was so strong. I didn't describe why the West was so good, because I don't believe in that, because I don't think that that's the valid answer to a good question. That's a valid answer to a bad question. But because we don't have time, let me just concentrate on one thing. We have been taxed, we Westerners, Europeans, uh, and I include the former communist system within the Western project, which has been an enlightenment rationalistic project to begin with, and, well, it ended in a similar disarray as this one is ending as we speak. So what, where have we got? If you take a walk in any European or American city, you will find a number of buildings on the roof of which you have a symbol. That symbol, the cross, means many things, but among many things it means something very simple. Namely, that the persecution of the innocent is wrong. This religion, Christianity, has glorified the instrument of vile death and torture into the greatest symbol of glory. We have been warned. We have been warned. The, the cross is everywhere. You only have to look at it, and you will be reminded 
that condemning somebody on the basis of unjust accusations and using for his unjust death vile political passions is wrong. And as, we, as you know very well, and it has been pointed out, we haven't learned much. Nevertheless, the sign is there. The sign is there. And that sign has been also put up by Westerners. Uh, freedom has been defeated many times, and Europeans, like also others, also others, it was not only Europeans who did unspeakable acts, just think of the Japanese army during the Second World War, what they did in Nanking, those were not Westerners. Neither rationalism, glory and humanism are a preserve of the West, nor is cruelty and genocide uh, a preserve of the West. We are just all poor sinners, if you allow me this remark, which is old-fashioned. Nevertheless, I do believe in it. And revolutions against dictatorships have been Westerns, Western, and dictatorships have been Western. There is no one single moral criterion according to which we can make such sweeping judgments. If there has been a sustained tradition that allowed some Westerners at least to get out from under uh, blind passion, fanaticism, cruelty uh, and injustice was the tradition of philosophy, the tradition of questioning. All cultures in which such uh, methods existed and so, is, so was India and so was China, as indeed it wasn't ancient Egypt, where which didn't have a philosophy, that habit of questioning, that habit of being independent of even that closed institutional world of former avatar of modernity allowed us to dissent and to begin anew, which won't absolve Leopold II, the king of Belgians, for having murdered more than five million Congolese under the benign colonial rule of a model liberal state. Uh, a lot of really interesting points being made on the panel and by our chair, of course. I guess I mean, it seems to me, if you look back over the long run of history, every major transition in the history of the world has happened first in one particular place and then in other places. Like the origins of agriculture, the origins of empires, both of these were first seen in Southwest Asia. In each case, they produced very distinctive sorts of societies. Initially, the patriarchal peasant household with agriculture, something the world hadn't seen before, then highly centralized imperial powers. They then popped up around uh, other parts of the world. Um, they, they spread out from Southwest Asia, but were invented autonomously in other parts of the world. Chinese empires, Indian empires, every bit as brutal as the empires you find at the southwest, uh, the, the western end of Eurasia. But they developed autonomously in different parts of the world. The great difference in the last few hundred years is that once one part of the world learns how to use fossil fuels, like Western Europe does in the 18th to 19th century, it can impose its power on a global scale faster than anything the world had ever seen before. So a particular set of values which is associated with market economy and particularly industrial production has come to be thought of as associated with a particular part of the world. There's nothing, I would still maintain, nothing specifically Western about these values of freedom and the autonomy of the individual. They're the ones that work best in these kinds of societies. No part of the world has any monopolies on virtue or vice. You know, any example you find of horribly wicked people in the West, you can find just as awful people in other parts of the world. Any saints you find in the West, there's equally wonderful people uh, in the other parts of the world. I guess my, my sense listening to what we were all saying was that um, we didn't really have any agreement around this table on what best meant, um, which means that perhaps the, the conversation is likely to sort of pass like ships in the night a little bit, unless we do have some agreement on what best means, if it means anything at all. The intention of this wasn't really to try and identify how many bad things Westerners have done or how many good things Eastern people have done. Or, uh, 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 in other words, can we try and raise above a kind of tally question? Just a quick comment, two, two quick comments on what Tarun said and what your response was, Claire. 
Tarun mentioned the institutional frameworks um, within the Western countries, uh, which are problematic areas. And I would like to just highlight one instance where you know, the West goes on harping about democracy, but it does not often, I mean, the governments are not democratic in their responses and in, the, in their impulses. And one instance that I have to share here that when I was a student in this country in 2001, I was in London among hundreds and thousands of people marching against the war in Iraq, and Prime Minister Tony Blair had, you know, had no respect for that mandate. He went ahead with his promises to his buddy Bush and uh, whatever his private God whispered in his ears. So, I mean, I don't think this whole bugbear of democracy sits very well within the West, yeah? That's one uh, response. You uh, also, uh, very interestingly, you said, uh, Claire, about the spin-off benefits of colonialism. And I would just like to point out that uh, Ramchandra Goha in his book on India since Gandhi mentions four great boons of colonialism. He mentions the English language, the railways, the bureaucracy, and finally cricket. Just, I just want to say something on the democracy thing because it just illustrates what I suppose I'm trying to uh, get over in this session. I do not think that um, the wars to bring democracy to the world or interventions to bring democracy to the world are in any way admirable. But I remember we had a debate here two years ago on democracy. And I kind of rather calmly said, you know, as somebody who believes in democracy because I believe in the subject being able to determine their, themselves and, and the autonomy of the subject being able to use not just a silly vote but actually determine politics. I support democracy. Somebody said, well, that's because you've got a Western way of looking at things. And in other countries, like China, they were using as an example, you know, you're fine. And you're just imposing. So I would suggest I support democracy, even if people try and accuse me of only doing so because I happen to live in London and I'm British. In other words, it's the concept and the value, I suppose, that I think is under stress at the moment. The abuse of the word democracy by British governments um, is nothing new, as we know, and uh, um, that's a slightly different point. Thank you. Um, I understand your wish to avoid a kind of guilt fest or whatever, but the title of the debate is, uh, draws our attention to something about the quality of the West. Best, my rhyme, but it does talk about something called the West. And I think one of the issues that uh, is, is hanging around in this discussion is a capacity for splitting in the West, uh, which can end up with a massively brilliant ability to smuggle, to smuggle one value in under the flag of another, which has been absolutely classically part of what the West has done. The, the institutions that were described have often delivered miners to death in mines, have, have delivered poor people to war zones for no reason at all, of our own people, if I dare use that expression. So it is a characteristic of the West that it has been able to use the rhetoric of the Enlightenment to smuggle the most primitive primitive human uh, values, as if they've somehow been pushed behind by history. We grew up through the, the Enlightenment, and therefore we've left that primitive stuff behind. The biggest danger of the Enlightenment is it suggests the primitive has gone. And the biggest danger of the notion of the West is best is to suggest that the West was ever only the Enlightenment. I wanted to chime in on what Ian said, his last comment, about what were the shared values. And I suppose in that sense to pose a question to... Um, Turin, which is which of the Enlightenment values and values around modernity do you disagree with? This is addressed to Professor Morris. You're suggesting a uh, geographically based view of development in the world. It'd be interesting if you compared your view with that of Professor Diamond in his book that we, most of us know about, if, even if we haven't read it, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel who also has a geographically based uh, kind of view of development. I wanted to actually start where Professor Tamash was. I thought it was an interesting um, way in which he ended because it's, it is worth looking around the world at the moment and we can look at the emerging countries um, such as India and China and look at the way in which their societies are organised or how their societies perhaps aren't organised, how perhaps they aren't up to scratch, how their 
um, elites very much behave like Western elites um, nowadays in terms of evading their responsibilities, evading accountability, evading their responsibility to build infrastructure like san you know, basic sanitation, you know, electrical um, grids that um, can and deal with economic um, growth and all the rest of it. I think that's a very interesting um, thing to look at it. Why is it now that we look um, across the world um, and we see elites in all of these countries who display um, uh, differing aspects of dysfunctionality and it's something to do with this question of organisation um, and mobilisation and let's remember <coughs> always that within the West that aspect of mobilisation was always slightly turned against itself. All the points that Tarrant made have been actually very, very hotly um, contested in the West. And if you want to look at the history of the West, you can actually see the, the history of the West is um, a battle um, of ideas. It's just, it seems at the moment that the good, good guys have been losing. When I'm on the London Underground, uh, I see a poster that quotes Mahatma Gandhi saying that there is more to life than going faster. If you know anything about the London Underground, Taron, you might differ with your mentor uh, there. And you might say that this belief in slow food, slow underground, slow down, and all of that was exactly the corruption of the good side of the West that uh, Sabina and Claire have pointed to. And I think it's a question relevant to you, Ian, because I didn't hear exactly through what subtle mediations geography created the Industrial Revolution and so on. And you did refer to fossil fuels. You will know that China is planning a five-day high-speed train system from Beijing to London. Would you not say that that actually subordinated geography to human endeavor, that attitudes were more important than latitudes? And would you not agree that it's not so much fossil fuels as Boffin's rule that really has made the West, and also now the East, because the West has forgotten about Boffin's, has made you know, modernity what it is? All those institutional energies peaked in two things, the welfare state, that's what I was talking about, actually, and, of course, the armies, and that creative and destructive energy was developed thanks to the immense capacity of mobilization that, of course, is based on the force of machinery, full stop. As, and what I want uh, to say, which I think is rather important, stop talking about Western values and Enlightenment values. Those are not values. Those are principles. When we say values, what do we mean? Values are, in the contemporary usage, beliefs of others we don't recognize but we find obliged to respect. <laughs> Therefore, the talk about values is a conversation stopper it tells you that, you know, you, this is like in a, in a pub, brawl. Are you really talking down my values, mate? You know, that's kind, that kind of discussion, that is not conducive to anything. Enlightenment is not values. Values mean opinions inherited, okay? Christian values it doesn't mean Christian beliefs. This is a behavior governed by Christian tradition without the belief. That's what is meant by that. Enlightenment or whatever else has principles that means propositions, sentences referring to realities that can be checked logically and empirically. You don't have to respect them. You are invited to refute them. That's the essence of enlightenment. If you speak of enlightenment values, it's that's as good as speaking of enlightenment witchcraft. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Ian. So I'm uh, just picking one thing. I have a short attention span, so I'm going to talk about the last question because it's the one I remember best. Yes, about how, how geography actually does stuff like determine one part of the world has an industrial revolution rather than another. Well, for that, you will have to read my book, I think is the, the quick answer to that. One of the points I uh, keep making, trying to make over and over again in my book is this, this back and forth sort of thing that I think geographical assets determine why different parts of the world develop at different rates, but, but the process of development changes what 
the geography means. And I think the, what you mentioned about the, you know, the high-speed trains um, being designed in China, this is a classic example of this sort of thing. As China has been drawn into more and more into the world global, uh, global economic system at the end of the 20th century, all of its resources and assets being sucked into this system to the point that it is beginning to turn into something that looks vaguely like a, a, the new core of this system for the early 21st century. Um, geography is being reshaped from China because of this. So, um, and this is, I think, exactly the sort of thing we should expect to see more and more of over the next 30 years. It's quite obvious that the West has, for a long, long time, used democracy, freedom, and other similar principles uh, simply rhetorically to uh, further its own ends and mask imperialist in other adventures. In fact, the whole concept of freedom, I think, completely was obscured for a better part of the last half century by the fact that America in particular and other Western nations used the term solely for the purposes of demarcation from any uh, other uh, countries that were not part of the Western system. So, of course, it's true. It's all been abused for rhetorical purposes. But I don't think that this um, degrades the principles of freedom, democracy, individuality in themselves, that they were abused in that sense. I have to respond to two quick uh, questions. One, I think Sabine has in some extent responded to the question about what are the Western values or in the professor's terminology, uh, principles that I have a problem with. None at all. My problem is not with the principles. My problem is with the gap, with the great chasm between the principles and what is done on the ground. So while you have these certain principles, for, for, while all the European colonial powers had these principles arising out of the Enlightenment, what they were practicing across Africa and Asia was something completely alien. It's like a vegetarian going out and chopping up the neighbor's uh, chickens. You know, so I mean, there's a problem there. So that's roughly what was happening. No problems with the principles. In fact, the Indian constitution, which is probably one of the most magnificent co uh, constitutions in the world, embodies the finest of the Enlightenment principles. Everything you can name, from individuality, liberalism, free speech, uh, the, the quest for equality, justice, it's all enshrined in the constitution. Coming back to my friend there about Gandhi, you have to understand Gandhi is far more complex than it's often made out. You probably don't know he wrote entire treatises on even defecation. I mean, the man wrote 100 volumes on everything under the sun. The, the point about Gandhi that I was trying to make, that's now we're talking about Mahatma Gandhi now, not any of the recent new Gandhis. Uh, the, the, po the point that Mahatma Gandhi was trying to make, intuiting way before uh, the rest of the world was going to intuit it, was that the planet cannot take unbridled runaway consumption. He was saying, he was not turning his back on modernity. He was not saying that the modern is bad. The man pretty much enshrined the Indian constitution by his beliefs, his beliefs in equality, in justice. But he was constantly saying, there is a problem with our consumption patterns. It cannot be sustained. We have to find a way of, of, of creating a, a society that, that does not overconsume. And I think today, around the world, those are what the debate's about. Unfortunately, even in this debate, in the debate about the carbon uh, uh, footprints, the West is again playing hooky with the rest of us. So America says, we have 10 times the carbon imprint of, of, of most of Asia, but we are not going to cut it down. Meantime, here's a charter for you guys to sign so that you cut your already low carbon imprint down even further. Taran put it uh, in his remarks that what the West is best at is consumption and profits. You know, well, I would make the point that without production, uh, there's no consumption and there's no profits. And the big thing that changed in the West was the organization of production with the development of capitalism. And, you know, that is the thing which spread uh, and, you know, spread around the world and uh, brought in its wake as it tried to uh, expand many of the horrors of imperialism that have been talked about. The product of that, I think, however, we have to recognize, expanded production, uh, is expanded possibility of human lives. Before capitalism, you know, we had peasants living off the land, ruled over by a few gangsters, and the occasional oasis of civilization. You know, with expanded production, that changed. There were struggles over democracy in the West, around the world. There were the institutions that have been talked about, and the possibilities for human life and freedom. Now, you know, I would suggest that now India, China, the rest of the world have taken up capitalism, have taken up expanded production, 
You know, they too are having to, to grapple with those problems. And, you know, we will solve them. We will not be constrained, I would suggest, by environmental limits. You know, we'll, we'll move forward. But, you know, that to me is the uh, most important accidental development in the West that has now become globalised. And the aspect of it that we should celebrate is increased production uh, and how to make best use of that to increase freedom and progress and happiness. I agree uh, with Sabina that um, so-called Western va values or principles are really universal ones. And I think what's, uh, they're being not upheld today, they're being undermined. But I think what's one of the most interesting things recently, but also most co more confusing, is that they're being undermined in the West by those who say they are pro-enlightenment. So you get the obvious case that you, people can really, you know, point to are things like, on the conservative side, where you see anti-Islam in the name of so-called defending the Western Enlightenment values against Islam, which basically tars all Muslims as potential terrorists and all this sort of stuff. But what you also see, and it's less recognized, but potentially more dangerous from those who want, I think, to promote universal uh, values of Enlightenment modernity, are those on the sort of more liberal progressive side. And there you can see a number of areas, like so for instance, the so-called new atheists in the name of enlightenment attacking religion, but in, the, in, in doing it in such a way that's really anti-humanist, that's kind of not recognizing the kind of human kernel of a lot of religious thought. Or the idea of, uh, of those who want to see action on climate change, who use science in a way that basically says if you don't agree with the science, this so-called enlightenment science, then you're a denialist and you're a her you know, that you're you're a heretic. I would like to uh, push Ian a little bit more on the geographical patterns and what lies behind that, which was kind of instigated there already. And that is, behind that is really innovation, the ability to innovate. And I think that was the strong point in recent history in the West. And I think that's where our fear is, is it that Asia is beginning to innovate and we're actually being a bit scared about that move. Long before Gandhi was a twinkle in anybody's eye, a rather more serious and German philosopher called Hegel was well aware that history, all of human history, was a slaughter bench, as he put it. He could also come out uh, with kind of semi-mystical uh, aphorisms like the rational is real and the real is rational. But th those were important insights that were made a long time ago, that we do have the power uh, through rationality to organize the world, and we can struggle over the way in which we want to organize it. We can have moral debates about what that way should be. The problem I think we're suffering from now is that when we list, come out with the litanies of Western abuse of power, living in the atomized society that Gaspar described so well in the beginning, what we're really doing is rejecting our own power as human beings. We may think we're being anti-imperialist and attacking that horrible record of the West, but we're really turning on ourselves. And we get some kind of perverse comfort, I would suggest, from, from fe you know, feeling good in a kind of self-loathing way that I don't have any power, I can't achieve much, at least I can't do any wrong in the world. That's a bit pathetic. I think we need to maybe do a lot more philosophy and a lot more reading and take ourselves more seriously. I think there is a, a problem with the term the West or even civilization or the Enlightenment because of the ways in which they're used uh, very differently. So I think talking, essentially the, the discussions I see it is about universal values. Um, the discussion about the West, the West, the term itself, came about because of defensiveness about what was used before that, which was the white race. And that was problematic uh, because of the rise of Japan, but also because of concerns about the white urban working class. Who, uh, so that's why the, the notion of the West became developed instead of the notion of the white race. But the reason why you have the notion of the white race, the reason why you have the notion of the West, is because those ideals of equality and liberty couldn't be delivered and there had to be some rationale for why they couldn't be delivered. And to me, what concerns me is that today, ideas about the relativization of values mean that we now have discussions about sustainability or about uh, Asian values. And in a position where you attack the West and universalism, it doesn't leave, it makes it difficult then to argue against the, those ideas of, or the idea of Asian values or the idea of uh, sustainability. 
my understanding of the, the West, or to try and get an example out of it, isn't it, isn't it just that the West has got a better, in theory at least, civil society or public culture? And if, if that's a relevant example, if I go on, on the bus tonight, am I more likely to have an interesting conversation on the way home than I am in somewhere in the East? Or is there an Eastern version of the Battle of Ideas? What are the things that you would say make a society, whether it's West or not, um, have those values that make people talk to each other? Or am I wrong in saying that there must be something in the, the quality of the public conversation that we're striving to have? I know I could go home in the bus tonight and someone could bottle me or, you know, he, I, or, you know he's been drinking more than I have, etc. But is there still something in the West where we think we're more likely to get that sort of debate and that that's better than it is in the East? Or is it better that, you know, that in an in Indian family, for example, tonight everybody's really polite and listening to mummy and daddy and doing what they're told? Is that better or, or am I stereotyping? Yeah, in the, in the title of this session, Is the West Still the Best?, there's, the, there's a kind of implication that other uh, countries are on the rise and the West may be in decline. But at the same time as this, we also see extreme globalization of Western culture through capitalism and also the, the very rapid spread of English um, all over the world. And this, both these things carry a lot of cultural baggage with them. So I was just wondering, do the panel think that there's going to be um, any kind of backlash to this? Or what does the future hold for the divide between the West and the rest of the world? And it basically, is the world becoming more homogenous or not? Or what does the future hold? I stand corrected on the difference and the distinction between values and principles by Gasper, but nonetheless, whether we call them principles or values, I, want, I wanted to uh, make this point at least. You see, Taryn, when you say those principles, I agree with all of those principles. It's not the principles, it's the gap between the principles and the reality. The problem is, is that most people don't agree on the principles anymore. And that, in a way, is what my nervousness is. And so the confusion and the conflation between the principles and the and the, as it were, the hypocrisy and the action or the brutalised action and the, or the inability to deliver freedom and so on and so forth ends up compromising the principles. And then you actually end up in a situation whereby, at least in the West, geographically now I mean, uh, although it might well be elsewhere, people are getting rid of the principles. They're using this as an excuse to get rid of the principles of the Enlightenment or modernity or what have you. And that is why you end up in a situation where you end up defending the principles and then people say, so you're defending Western principles and you end up saying as though you're defending the West in the sense of Western imperialism or geog geographically. So I know it's a bit confusing, but I think it's quite important because it actually has an intimidating atmosphere in the West when you're trying to argue in defense of certain important gains of uh, the modern period, when people try and actually deal with you by accusing you of being a pro-Western imperialist type, because, for example, you're dis defined, uh, defending high art, or because you're defending democracy, because you're defending freedom, uh, secular society, or whatever it is. Cultural relativism uh, is kind of brought to bear and you are kind of castigated out as being in defense, as I said, the indefensible. That's one thing. And then the final tiny thing, which was actually also in res response to Taryn's point about Gandhi's attitude to consumption. I mean, personally speaking, I'd like to say for the record now, Western, Eastern, Universal or whatever, I am absolutely, totally 120% pro-consumption. Um, I don't want people to have to consume less. I think it is really good that people have the capacity to deal with the consumption question, which is one of the gains of having a modern uh, industrialized society. My concern at the moment is, is that uh, in the West, there is no dynamic that will mean that we are actually being told to tighten our belts and consume less, and that's turned into kind of some moral ethic, uh, because if we don't, we'll either destroy the planet or we're destroying uh, values or whatever it is, and what I would suggest is that we haven't got enough. The world has not got enough. Now, this is not because I just want us all to have more stuff, nice shoes, handbags, nothing wrong with any of those things. But in general, as a point of principle, I do not think we have enough. And so I am not apologetic about being pro-consumption. And if Gandhi didn't like it, I do. I don't care. I don't care where it came from. That's the deal. Okay. Just to sort of clarify things, I mean... Uh... 
I would describe myself as a Western liberal. In India, I would say I'm a Western liberal by philosophy, by theory. Uh, and most of the things that we discuss today are the stuff that I fight for on a daily basis in India. I, and most of the stuff that Claire mentioned is stuff that I fight for with my, with my life and my, the life of my journalists being on the line. So I believe in all that. My contention here is very simply that you've got to cut the hypocrisy about imagining the West has been doing it right and continues to do it right. There's a gap between the ideas, which are gorgeous ideas, which are ideas of fine thinkers, and those fine thinkers can come both from the East and West, and the ways it's been executed. And, and a lot of that has to do with, with the kind of depredations. And I'll tell you what the crisis today is. The crisis is not that India and China are rising in the East. The crisis is that for the last two decades, suddenly the old double standards can no longer be held up. You can't operate by the old hypocrisies and the old double standards because the world is an open oyster. Information is open to everybody. We all know exactly what Halliburton is doing, what Shell is doing. We know exactly the corporates that are leveraging politics for private gain. It's no longer so easy to go on holding up, holding double standards. And that's what I'm arguing against. And as I said, I make a very clear distinction. I make a very clear distinction between people and power structures. And I think a lot of our, our particular animus is against power structures that, that are not so much, and not in fact ever the people. As for lastly, as for the business about consumption, I have to say that even though I love to consume, I fear and I believe that we will have to, if not now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, look at the Gandhian ethic that the planet just does not have enough for 10 billion people to consume. Let me warn you, there was somebody there who talk, talked about the glories of the Green Revolution. Let me just tell you, my friend, that even today, 700 million people in India live at sub-Saharan poverty levels. There are more poor people in India than the entire population of Africa. So we are still struggling. We are in deep trouble. The problem is most of you, uh, most people in a, in a room like this only hear about the Lakshmi Mithils and the glorious stories of the Indian billionaires. That it's, it is true 200 billion Indians are seeing a great economic efflorescence, but there are also 700 million Indians who are struggling to even eat a single meal a day. So we are in a very difficult and complex place. It's, it's not going to be easy to, to, for someone to tell me the West is the best, which has pretty much sucked the, the, the sap out of the subcontinent over 300 years. It just doesn't ring right. I don't think it's even right today. Well, Tarun, just because of what you just actually said, I would argue that growth, which is happening in the world now, and thank God it's happening in areas where there was too little of it in the past, is about the best thing that's happening at the present time. But in our Western societies itself, uh, themselves, we don't appear to believe in that anymore. So one of the things I strongly object to and see as a fallback behind the kind of convictions and principles we used to have is that in my country, in Germany and generally across Europe, people actually believe that countries like India or China shouldn't grow because that is going to be a problem for us and for the carbon footprint and all the rest of it. And that, I think, is a shrinking back from belief in what we can achieve altogether in the world through reason, good production, growth, and indeed consumption, as Claire said too, I, I fully agree with her there. So I think that the problem we have to take a bit more seriously is that within Western society itself, we are experiencing profound confusion, a loss of conviction in a number of things that are absolutely essential to a good life in the world, which is individual freedom, freedom from as far as possible from straight state regulation, and a whole number uh, of other things that are being denigrated. And within that, in fact, I think that some of the most anti-other parts of the world statements are in fact coming from the people who are arguing for sustainability, for let's not have so much freedom, let's not have so much growth, so much production, let's you know, just restrain our horizons a bit. Oh, shock horror, now we have these billions of people down there who also want to have their part of the modern world, and everybody is shocked about that. That, that is the reality as I experience it in, in my uh, country, Germany, or across Europe in political debate today. And uh, that's what I think we really have to take very seriously. Whereas everybody would agree with you on some of the points you made earlier about how bad we've all been and all the rest of it, but nonetheless they would support precisely these 
unenlightened ideas that I uh, wholly object to. If I may uh, establish something that uh, an Indian author called Rohindran Mystery, who is now being persecuted by fascist lynch mobs of the Shiv Sena in India, uh, is called a delicate balance. Well, I would like to, to restore something like a delicate balance. There are elements of Western peculiarity in what we're talking about. If you look at the 19th century, there's, there have been things in the West, from the psychological novel to the de development of social sciences, that are unique to Europe, which doesn't mean that we are more valuable. Certainly, we were different. But there is something that, that is quite unique. It used to be unique to the West. It is a peculiar Western idea, and it was a peculiar Western reality. It is called civil society. Civil society is very much misunderstood these days, but I am going back to Hegel's view of civil society, which encompasses the market and political parties. Civil society are not the NGOs, right? Civil societies are all those institutions that are not under an authority in which you can check in and from which you can check out voluntary institutions. Voluntary institutions are a very valuable invention. And also, I, uh, although I am an anti-capitalist myself, I'm not within this anti-capitalism, anti-market at all. Market capitalism is usually better than state capitalism. I hate both, but state capitalism even a little more. But what is really valuable in this, really, this heritage, which is a European heritage, of extolling institutional arrangements that can synthesize institutional coercion with freedom. The character of voluntary participation and the freedom to leave. And this is the idea behind this, isn't it? Yes. Well, we, you know, we, this is not a parliament. We are discussing something and then we don't take a vote. What we take away are just puzzles. As usual, when there's a lot of really great questions from the floor, I'm going to do what I normally do, which is ignore them all completely right. and talk about what I want to talk about. Uh, so I just wanted to just say a few words, although you told us not to, about the, the title of the session, Is the West Still the Best? And it seems to me the answer is very obviously no. West never was the best, if by that we mean does a, you know, this small group of nations around the North Atlantic have some particular set of virtues which makes it morally superior to the rest of the planet? I mean, this just seems to me absolutely... You know, nonsense idea, even though it's a very popular idea. It seems to me that people are much the same all over the world. Uh, values like you know, inventiveness and creativity and democracy and so on that we like to think of, or some people like to think of as specifically Western. These are values you find in people all over the world, all through history, but in different historical contexts, different sets of values and ideas seem to work better. I mean, democracies have been very rare in history, but there have been episodes when they've worked very well. In recent times, democratic sets of values that we often label as Western, have worked particularly well. They've spread very widely around the world, but that, I think, is, again, because you look over the long run of history, soft power follows hard power. Values get spread from the places that have the military and economic power to those who don't. People emulate Roman culture. Romans don't emulate Germanic culture. People emulated Ming and Tang Dynasty Chinese culture. The Ming and Tang Dynasty Chinese were not, on the whole, emulating the cultures they found in other parts of the world. And I think, I mean, coming back just to Claire's point about consumption, uh, to, to wrap up, one thing you can say is Western ways of doing things, if you want to label it that way, have been spectacularly good for consumption. People over the whole world, not talking just about people in the West now, on average human beings now live 30 years longer than they did a century ago. On average they're five inches taller. On average their real wages are about twice as high as they were a hundred years ago. On average we feel utterly different in our bodies from the ways any human beings have done before the last hundred years. The human body has changed more in a hundred years than it changed in the previous hundred thousand. And this has been driven by the spread of a particular 
particular way of doing things that began in Northwest Europe. It's unlikely, it seems to me, that this way of doing things is going to remain the same or that we're going to continue associating it with Northwest Europe. But if by best you mean has the West delivered more stuff to people around the world than anything else ever, then yes, very much. If by is the West best you mean are Westerners somehow just better people than everybody else, then that self-evidently seems silly to me. Can we thank our panel, please, please?